we stand in the need of you. Father, as we gather now as a collective body of believers, we certainly ask that you have your way in this place. As we come now to the preach word, I pray now, God, that you touch your preacher. Hide me humbly behind your cross. Guide these clumsy lips of clay, that they might articulate your word, not my own. Now, God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, for you indeed are my strength and redeemer. It is only in the precious and perfect name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray. And the redeemed of the Lord say it. Amen. Amen. Grab your Bibles and join me in Matthew's Gospel, the 15th chapter, verse number 21. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 15, verse number 21. If you've got it, say amen. Amen. If you need a little more time, say don't turn up. Chapter 15, verse number 21. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sodom. And behold, a woman of Cana came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her, not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O oh, woman, Great is your faith. Let it be to you as your you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Just a few moments of time, I'd like to concentrate our examination of this passage around the thought, the transforming power of faith. The, the, the transforming power. Matthew provides for us, Reverend Hazelwood, a sweeping and captivating understanding of Jesus, his time, his tenure during his earthly visit. What was in the first chapter of Matthew, Joseph, that we see Jesus coming down 40 and two generations to be born to Mary and Joseph and Baron destitute and deplorable conditions. It was, it was in Matthew chapter number two that we see wise men visiting from the east to bring gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to celebrate the birth of the divine, the only individual born already older than their mother. It was in chapter three, Jesus is baptized in the wilderness, after which the celestial clouds parted, emitting solar rays beaming from heaven, allowing the S-U-N to shine brightly on the S-O-N, at which point God declares, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus overcomes temptation in Matthew chapter number four, and he begins his earthly ministry with a casual stroll along the Sea of Galilee, Sarge calling two brothers, Simon Peter and Andrew, along with James and John, becoming the first disciples that would touch and transform the lives of everyone whom they 
encountered. And, and so now in this text, we see Matthew, the author, with a, a pen of haste, recording the profound and prolific messages proclaimed by he who knew sin, not messages of, of murder, adultery, love, prayer, and wealth. Matthew chronicles the miraculous transformation of leprous men, the calming of raging seas, and the forgiveness of sinful paralytics. This impressive resume or dossier, if you will, brings us breathlessly in awe to this 15th chapter where a casual glimpse of a superb savior comes screeching to a surprising halt. For well, it is here in this 15th chapter that Jesus has just completed an expository le lecture Frazier family settling a debate over tradition. He has departed from a speaking engagement to rest in the region of Tyre and Sidon. There he encounters a Canaanite woman who has traveled no less than about 40 miles since McGee to meet Jesus. Yeah. Now, if you're anything like me, that should have pinched you when you read it because there are times in life when we must declare that no matter how far I must go, no matter how long it will take to get there, no matter how much the travel expenses or how many of my freaking flyer miles I might lose or use, there are times when I've got to get to Jesus. If I've got to press my way, claw my way, crawl if I have to, but there are times in life when the circumstance outweighs the inconvenience and the focus becomes less on comfort and more on Christ, less on self and more on the Savior. I've got to get to Jesus. This woman, this woman, she left her country, her culture, and her kin to seek out Jesus. And it arrests my attention, Deacon Walters, at the realization that the woman is not referred to by name. No, no, no. Matthew doesn't provide a specific name. Rather, he gives us an unambiguous indication of who she is, but provides a clear understanding of what her problems are. Yeah. He, he doesn't give a name, but gives the nature of her concerns. And, and I am convinced that the name is not important here because every now and again, life will have it such that you and I will have to insert our name in the text and list our own life's troubles. Every now and again, life will have it such that a name is not necessary here because on any given day, Kamika, I might need to insert my own name for I've come to recognize that in life we tend to occupy one of three stages. We either having just come out of a storm, yeah. we're in a storm, yeah. or Sister Jordan, we're on our way into a storm. Yeah. For Murphy's Law says it like this, if it's not one thing, then it tends to be something else. It, it often seems like you take one step forward and here comes life pushing you two steps backwards. Here, this unnamed yet burdened woman finds it necessary to press her way into the presence of Jesus. Yes. Yes. For life, life has gotten her beat, burdened, bruised, yet determined to press her way to the church house. Yes. Deacon Morgan, messy, clothes not matching, tears running down her face, yet she's determined to get to Jesus, smelling poorly, shoes tattered, items spilling out of her purse, yet pressing her way to Jesus. That's why we've got to be careful of how we approach folks as they come into the house of God, because behind broad smiles are constant struggles, struggles with family, struggles with health, struggles with career, struggles with finances. Be careful of how you treat folks because you never know who you're speaking to and what you're dealing with. Be careful to assume a position that I've got mine, you better get yours because Big Mama said, baby, the same ones you pass on your way up, you're going to meet them on your way back down. You might got a reserved parking spot in the corner office today, but child, you don't know what tomorrow might bring. So I just say, there with grace, go out. Be careful of how you deal with folks. You never know what, know what they're dealing with. So Reverend Hazelwood, this woman presses her way. Yeah. This is an encouraging word because you ought not let, ever let, any of your circumstances stop you from getting the word you need. Yeah. Never, never let the devil whisper in your ear to stay where you are. The devil is a lie. I will press 
it may not seem popular, but push. You may not want to, but push. It, it might be tough, but you've got to de de develop the tenacity of a trout. I'll swim upstream if I have to, but you've got to press your way into the presence of God, for it is thou that there is peace. It is thou that there is liberty. It is thou that there is joy. I've got to get to Jesus. And so when folks see you after church, they ought to be able to tell that you were with Jesus because despite the hell in your life, you still get joy. Despite the circumstances in your life, I am still assured that Jesus is mine. Despite the difficulties of life, I like Don Cornelius have love, peace, and soul. Brother Joe, she leaves her country. She leaves that which is familiar to her. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, if you want to get to where you are, where you're going, you've got to be willing to leave some stuff behind. You can't take everything and everybody with you. Young folks, there's going to be a time where you've got to separate from some folks if you're going to get to what God has for you. Never will I forget at O'Hare International Airport. My wife and I were going on vacation. She had a bag on this hand. She had a bag in this hand. She had a purse coming around and strapped over here. She had a carry-on strapped over here. And she yelling at me to come on with my stuff. <laughs> Never will I forget it. There was an elderly black lady working at the, the ticket agent or the ticket counter there for American Airlines. And she looked and she said, Baby, if you're going to get to where you're going, you're going to have to check some of your baggage. Progressive, can I pull you off the pew and let you know that if you're going to get to where you're going, you've got some baggage that you've got to check. There's going to be some stuff that you've got to leave behind. Put it in there, be here when you get back. But if you're going to get to what God has for you, it ain't got nothing to do with you. This is between my God and I. But he's got a bigger assignment for you. So excuse me. You're more than welcome to get your own ticket. But as for me and my house, I've got to get to where God is sending me. So she says, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Son, son of David. What, what an interesting dynamic. You see, son of David is his political name. That, that's his historical name. The name the Jewish audience would understand. Lord, however, that's his personal name. Son of David indicates she knows his history. But Lord indicates she knows a God. I, I like what she does here. She says, my problem is great. And, and my grief it is real. My, my sorrow is deep. My child is sick. Son of David, I, I know your history. I, I know your past. I know your title. But I also know you for myself. So now I've got to move from who you were. Now I've got to move from what you've done for everybody else. Now I've got to move from what I read about in Sunday school. And I've got to call you from myself. Every now and again, son of David is all right. When I'm coming up, son of David is all right. When I'm not going through nothing, son of David is all right. When somebody else is paying the bills, son of David is all right. But now that Nyko and Comrade is coming in my name, I've got to call Lord. Now that I've got to get up and go to work every day, I've got to say, Lord, Lord, help me. I know the classes are tough students, but you've got to go beyond son of David and say, Lord, help me. I know the challenges are real and the kids are bad, so Lord, help me. I know the budget is tight, but God will make a way. She moves Ayari beyond son of David to Lord. And she says, Lord, help me. Ah, the 
come and watch the text. Jesus is silent. Yes. He answers her not a word. She's left her country. She's left her family. She's left everything she's ever known himself. She, she gets to Jesus and he answers her not a word. Was it worth it? I've stepped outside of my box and now I'm struggling. Certainly I could have struggled at home. Come here, Tyler Perry, I can do bad. All by myself. I, I came for help, yet Jesus is silent. Watch the text. The disciples then urge Jesus to get rid of her because she cries after us. Sister Pippin, they confused who they were with who they were with. Yes. And you see, that's the danger of elevating yourself too highly in association with the one whom you serve. Be careful how you elevate yourself in your walk with Jesus. Be, be very careful of getting connected with Jesus, then looking down a sanctified nose at those who aren't, because you may very well block those from Jesus who need him, who need them the most. Now Jesus responds. He says, I've only been sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Now notice that the woman has been relatively silent. She says, son of David, Lord, I need your help. Jesus ignores her. He then gives a response, and now she responds. The, the timing of her response is interesting. She didn't respond to the disciples. She, she didn't respond to the critics. She, she didn't waste her time responding to the folks hating on her. No, 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 no. She waited for Jesus. Sometimes we get so caught up in the messy that we miss the Messiah. Don't spend another breath responding to the critics and the haters. You just wait for God to communicate with you and the rest will take care of itself. You don't have to justify yourself. You don't have to argue with anybody. You don't have to defend your position. You just wait for Jesus. And the rest will work itself out. She's, she's right there at Jesus. And, and though he is silent, she was right at the edge. And I'm concerned, beloved brothers and sisters, that oftentimes we get right there at the edge. Yes. Right there at the cusp. Yes. And throw in the towel. Yes. How easy it would have been when Jesus did not respond to her to throw in the towel and uh, go back to Cana. How, how easy would it have been for her to get distracted by the critics and those that were making noise and turn around and go back home. She, she come right there to the edge where she thought it wasn't going to work out. And there are at least three or four people under the sound of my voice that are right there on the edge where it seems like it just might not work out. There's somebody right there on the edge Wondering is it if it's even really worth it. There's somebody right there where they must decide if I'm going to turn around and go back home or push on just a little, a little while longer. Well, I got up at 5.30 this morning, came across a snowy Interstate 88, paid my toes to let two or three people know that don't throw up just because you're right there on the edge. Don't throw in the towel. Don't wave the flag of defeat. Rather, hold your head back and declare like the woman, Lord, help me. This Gentile woman had no claim to a Jewish Messiah, but she bridges the gap between son of David to Lord and says, help me. She, she moves from the historicity of who he was to the reality of who he is. She yes. recognizes that yes, Lord, son of David, who was there at the creation of time as part of that Godhead known as the Holy Trinity who stepped out in unison, yes. and said something and everything came into yes. existence. It was he that was there with Daniel in the lion's den. Yes. It was he with the three Hebrew boys in the 
fiery furnace. It was he yeah. that Jonah in the belly of the whale. It was he that yeah. kept me when I couldn't keep myself. It was he that yeah. made a way out of no way. It was he that yeah. woke me up this morning. It was he that started me on my way. You blessed me when I slept last night. You blessed me when I walked into the church. And so now I will say that this is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. As a matter of fact, in the words of the hypnologist, the Lord is blessing me right now. Jesus says, it is not good to take the children's bread, Harper, and feed it to the little dogs under the table. It, it, it seems offensive. Yeah. 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 Jesus, did, did you, did you just call that woman a, a dog? Yeah, I mean, the one that was a little salty. Did you, did you just call her? It seemed offensive. But let us not get too puffed up on self. Watch the text. A child and a little dog are certainly dynamically different. But they have this one thing in common. Child and a dog, both dynamically different, but they both must be fed. I like this woman because she says, I'm not concerned with the bread on the table or on the bread of the floor, but I do know that you are the bread of life. So I need you to speak, Lord, for here I am. I don't know how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, or when you're going to do it, but I need your help. Jesus then moved by her sense and demonstration of responsibility. Jesus then moved by her tenacity. Jesus then moved by her bold demonstration. Put a nickel in the meter. Let me park right there for a minute. Isn't it good to know that we can move heaven? Even though isn't it good to know that in the midst of our circumstances, we can still get the attention of God. Isn't it good to know that when hell is on every side, I can still say, God, here am I. He that hung the earth in the atmosphere, sat it on its axis around the sun with such delicate dexterity and perfect harmony that if we were any closer, we'd burn and any further, we'd freeze. A God that has that amount of power would still, little old I, to still get his attention. As a matter of fact, in kindergarten, I learned that he was walks with me and he, and he talks with me and he tells me that I'm his own. I'm not cocky, I'm just proud to know that I got a God that walks with me. He walks with me when I'm in the valley. He walks with me when I'm on the mountain top. He walks with me when I'm happy. He walks with me when I'm sad. As a matter of fact, it's because he was walking with me when I was sad that I was able to transcend my midnight of morning of night into the joy of morning. Headed to my seat. I'm headed to my seat. Now, in the words of Reverend Dr. Samuel Dewitt Proctor, here's the relevant question of this text. Now, will human division influence divine provision? Here, this woman is a Gentile in a Jewish context, a woman in a male dominated culture, an individual who should otherwise be thrown to the wolves. But here she is having a conversation with Jesus. Here, here she is that, that should have been on the outskirts. She had no business even being in the church house. She wasn't no Jew, she was a Gentile. And even the fact that she was a Gentile is insignificant because she was a woman. And in the nomenclature, in the time of the text under consideration, women were seen as property. They were seen as an afterthought. How dare she have the unmitigated audacity to think that she could declare anything from the Messiah. Here she is, but she declares that here I am. I am so glad that I serve a God that does not look at my situation. I am so glad that I serve a God that does not look at the should be's of life. Well, you know the should be's of life. I should be dead. I should 
be sleeping in my grave. If I was not sleeping in my grave, I should be in a straight jacket, rocking in somebody's institution. But the God I serve said, if you press your way to me, I still have use for you. So the answer to the relevant question then is no. No, the absurdity of our human condition does not limit a God who knows no bound. A, a God that will send his only begotten son down 40 and two burning generations. Sail into captivity. Carry a cross to Calvary's hill. They hung him high and they stretched him wide. He hung his head and on a dark and dusty Friday night, he hung his head and he died for me. And hell got happy. It seemed like on Friday night the answer was yes. It seemed like on Friday night the answer was yes. Heaven will not intervene. So all day Friday night, hell threw a party. They partied all night long on Friday night. They woke up on Saturday morning still turned up. They had a few mimosas and said, where the party at? All day Saturday they thought that he was dead. All day Saturday they thought it was over. All day
doors of the church are open. Once you come, my brother, my sister, if you're here, if you're under the sound of my voice, and you say, you know what? I want some of that joy. I, I need some of that joy. It's available to you. And the good news is there's no cover charge. It's free to you, right? Now. Once you come. with him that created all of existence. That you want you come. If you're under the sound of my voice, you want to connect with the God, not with religion, but with relationship to the master. This is your opportunity, don't you come? Secondly, if you say, preacher, I'm new to the area, I want to join a membership. I already know what it's like to have a personal relationship with God. I know what it's like to have that joy. I've got it myself. I just need to connect with, connect with the fellowship. If that's you, you want to partner with Progressive Baptist Church, now is your opportunity. Won't you go? Sitting up, we've done as you've asked, Father, let the Spirit. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, our Father in heaven, how we thank you for this opportunity to have an experience with you. We thank you, God, for being a God that sits on high and looks down low. We thank you, God, for being a God that can transform every frown into a smile. We thank you, God, for transforming every mess into a message. Thank you for changing every test into a testimony. We thank you for what you've already done, for it demonstrates your ability to help us transcend that which we go through right now. Father, I pray now for my brother, my sister, that I stand in connection with. I pray, Father, that we leave now differently from the manner in which you came. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only God who alone is wise, now be all glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Let us say amen. Say amen.